works. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, I just learned a short while ago that I'd be the first one, you know, um, <laughs> on the podium. So um, forgive me if I'm a bit nervous. <clears throat> right. Um, I'm going to talk to you about, about the work that we do at Changamka. Uh, Changamka actually, I think, you know, it's important to know what it means. Uh, is a Swahili word that means, you know, <laughs> all right? That's what it means. <laughs> so I think in your own words, you know, you can figure out what it is. But it really means, you know, feel good, you know, be happy, all right? Um, and we, we took this essentially um, to look at to, um, healthcare as feeling good, you know, being, you should feel good, not, not, not sick. So we don't look at, at, at illness and healthcare uh, from a, a negative side. We look at it, you know, very, very positively. So, um, and we've done quite a lot of things, so I'll try and just rush through that and, and hopefully then we'll then have the discussions, you know, after my presentation. Um, the, we started operations in the year 2009, and, um, you know, our uh, mission is we use technology and mobile money primarily to establish uh, health financing mechanisms. Uh, essentially, uh, our aim is to tackle the you know, challenges of accessibility, affordability, awareness, and distribution of, of health, especially to the low-income segment of society. Um, and in so doing, to develop um, the technological infrastructure that uh, can then enable us establish a paperless, real-time transactions, and key to it is the establishment of electronic uh, medical records. This is uh, the demographics of uh, our country. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, wilderness uh, migration. Anybody here? Right, thank you. Now, that actually depicts the sort of uh, demographic uh, situation that we have, in that we have a very, very, you know, mobile um, population. Um, there was, for the you know, last, you know, sort of 30 or 40 years, uh, a large um, rural urban migration. But as you can see, I've said there that we have a rural urban rural migration, in that uh, we've got a new constitution under which you know, there is a um, decentralization and, um, you know, counties are being established. So there is actually a re-migration back to the rural areas. And um, as a result of this, you know, um, you know certainly for the health uh, sector, you know, you do have people moving quite a lot around. And um, just uh, other issues about our, you know, uh, demographics. 75 percent of the population is between LSM um, one and five. Um, and since this, you know, presentation is about lessons, and the first lesson that uh, you know I just wanted to highlight is that the solution to mobility is mobility, i.e., the solution to delivering health to people who are moving all over the place is essentially to use mobile uh, technology. Um, just, um, you know, a situation analysis about our country, we've got 40 million people and less than 10% of them have some form of health um, uh, arrangement, whether, you know, micro insurance, health insurance or any formal arrangement by employers. So a very significant number of people do not have uh, any formal arrangement. Now, um, just to give a background, um, over 90% of uh, the adult population in Kenya have access to a mobile phone. That's a very large number. About 65-70% actually own a phone, but in terms of access, 90% of Kenyans you know, do have access to a mobile phone. How about mobile money usage? The total mobile money transactions in Kenya is equivalent to 25% of the gross domestic product. And it is a fact that over 50% of the world's annual mobile money transactions happen in Kenya. The service 
um, led by M-Pesa, which I, I think everybody sort of knows about, has more customers than the total number of bank accounts in 46 financial institutions. So with this situation, we have um, a very you know, fertile um, ground for establishing a health and microinsurance you know, um, platform running on the mobile technology and mobile money. What then is the strategic opportunity for us? It was, um, you know, because health, you know, really ranks among, you know, the high, um, you know, top needs in our society. The question that we have to grapple with as uh, Changamuka is, you know, why is it that with, you know, that, that health then still lags behind? Healthcare is something that has not then been given sufficient, you know, has not um, been sufficiently grounded. And why is it that it's not marketed? Like, like other goods and services. Lesson, healthcare for us is just a commodity and should be treated as such in the marketplace. And you'll see how we've then dealt with that. In Nairobi, and uh, Anna, you're coming to Nairobi in January, okay? living there. Um, you can actually buy bread by the slice, okay? You can buy sugar by the spoonful. Right? So that's, you know, um, straightforward for us in that in terms of affordability, you don't actually have to buy a loaf of bread. You know, if you want bread, you can buy it by the slice. If you want a little tea in your sugar, a little sugar in your tea, sorry, you just buy it by, by the spoon. All right? And therefore, how can we uh, use this same sort of thinking uh, in healthcare? We have used uh, technology to slice the healthcare for easier affordability and accessibility. Um, we have provided electronic medical savings platform so that income can be saved little by little in slices for healthcare. So similarly, healthcare can be procured in slices. Rather than paid for annually in advance, it can be paid for per visit, monthly, all right? And therefore, the lesson here, we have taken the M in M Health as the knife that slices healthcare. How do we do this? Just without going through the whole, the whole uh, uh, busy slide, essentially we've taken um, the you know, uh, lesson of marketing in that you know, healthcare, you know, health is a product like other products. It can be priced like other products. You know, um, it can be distributed, it can be promoted and packaged just like other products. It can be placed in the shopping basket just like other products, right? There is sufficient demand for it, right? There's enough supply of it. And therefore, you know, all we need to do is to work out the pricing and distribution and we have a commodity that can actually find its way into people's shopping basket. Here are some of the ways in which it has been sliced. One of the questions we ask is, is it always necessary to see a doctor when you're in unwell? Can a nurse or a clinical officer do the job just as well? Can a patient simply call a doctor? Can we actually slice a doctor? <laughs> and um, Safaricom, you know, uh, who is uh, our key partner, uh, is, uh, has established uh, what they call a Dactari 1525, which is really a call a doctor service. Right? So because of the very, you know, large, you know, the, the, the proportion of doctor to patient is so high, you can call a doctor from wherever you are and you will be able to get, you know, advice. Uh, they do not do any prescription over the phone, but you, you do get, you know, advice, uh, first aid guidelines, ETC. You can actually even, they've recently in September launched uh, not just a call a doctor, but a see a doctor, which is a video consulting, you know, um, service, which enables one to actually be able to consult a doctor um, uh, on video. All right. So what we have done, um, as Changamka, we uh, established the following products. One, a prepaid smart card that enables one to save by loading money from their M-Pesa onto a sequestered uh, account on the smart card and the card is ready for use upon you know purchase it's um, if you go with a Changamka card
card to any provider, you get a better price than if you go, uh, if you use, uh, if you go with cash. And it's a bearer card, can be shared by the family. You can share it. Among, it's among the very few things uh, in Nairobi that one can share with one's mother-in-law. Um, however, we have then migrated in November. With this, we've been running for three years, but we've now migrated, and it's all going to run on the, on, uh, off uh, the mobile phone. So you can load money from your, smart, from your phone onto um, uh, a locked-up account, uh, medical savings account on your phone for healthcare. We have also developed um, a mobile voucher program. Essentially, um, as a you know um, health subsidy program, um, to take care of you know we have various voucher programs, but to replace paper vouchers. So, for ease of distribution, we have these uh, mobile vouchers that can be delivered across the country uh, for, uh, especially for maternal health, you know, uh, voucher programs. Uh, it is, uh, we've named it M Cardi, and, um, you know, we use community health workers to deliver these vouchers. Um, they identify the women who, you know, are eligible, and the women then get vouchers, and these vouchers are essentially subsidies which they go with to the local uh, health provider, who the health provider logs onto our system, and with the number that they've been given, they're able to, you know, to, uh, to um, uh, you know, provide the services that have been pre-agreed, you know, with the, with, with the voucher, um, with, with the voucher uh, funding agency. Finally, um, in recognition of the fact that uh, not all um, health services can be procured or can be financed by just savings, that sometimes savings on the mobile phone is not enough uh, because of you know, severe cases of, uh, of uh, you know, illness um, and uh, especially in hospitalization. We have then um, actually not, we've now ventured into um, health insurance as a line. And what we've then done is to develop a platform that enables people that, you know, you make your savings from your mobile money onto the, mo onto the health savings account, and when your money reaches a certain threshold, then it starts buying you an affordable health insurance cover by, once again, slicing it, i.e. that you're able to make savings, right, continuously. It's only when it reaches a certain threshold that it buys you insurance. It means that, you know, insurance then starts becoming affordable. And um, um, the way that this one works, that uh, in our, um, you know, uh, cooperation or our partnership with, with, uh, with Safaricom, which is the largest mobile, you know, provider in, in Kenya, uh, you are able to register yourself for the insurance on your phone. You dial um, star 525 hash, that's a USSD code. Uh, it comes back with a menu, and you have various options, and you can select buy insurance. And that essentially gives you a number. You're registered for insurance. There are additional details for which you may need to go to the local supermarket where we have, you know, uh, distributors, and they will then take your picture, take a photo of your ID. But essentially, you've then got yourself onto an insurance program, and you can then continue saving until you have enough money to buy yourself, you know, um, cover. Um, there is also to that um, a mobile, you know, uh, application that has been developed for the hospitals. So hospitals that do not have computers are essentially able to treat people uh, using, you know, um, smartphones, $100, you know, um, you know um, smartphones uh, that are, um, you know, internet uh, enabled. Um, and it all sits on the Safaricom cloud. Um, essentially, you know, we have been able to then link, have an ecosystem that enables individuals to register, save, buy insurance, get, you know, and even the claims payments are all done, you know, um, by, by, uh, by M-Pesa. So um, one final lesson, um, and this we got from, you know, um, we've been working quite closely with the uh, ILO Microinsurance Innovation Facility, that, you know, some, uh, for 
the success of programs like ours requires a lot of, you know, uh, partnership, a lot of, um, you know, good management of, of partnerships. And I think, I believe that's what's really got us to where we are. Uh, we have uh, in our new partnership, we launched uh, our microinsurance product last week, and um, it has, you know, an insurance company. We have Changamka, we have Safaricom with M-Pesa, and Population Services International, which is also giving us some support on the social marketing and, um, and um, uh, you know, provider accreditation. So um, the partnership is what we believe has, you know, got us to where we are, and uh, we are looking forward in 2013 to now try and scale our product countrywide, um, you know, um, and we hope to then, you know, get the really large numbers of people doing both savings and uh, uh, sorry, medical savings and medical microinsurance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. I'm very much looking forward to seeing all of this in action in Nairobi in January. Um, our next speaker is Mark Davies, who I'm um, excited to introduce. Mark and I actually met a couple years ago when I was in Accra. Um, I was working at Google at the time, uh, leading our emerging market product development, and got to visit his new offices um, and uh, kind of see everything amid all the painting and construction at the time. Uh, hopefully the office is a little bit more settled down by now. Um, but Mark is the founder and CEO of Isoku Networks, a profiling and messaging platform which serves smallholder farmers, agribusinesses, and national projects in 16 countries across Africa. Um, Mark, in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2001, Mark moved to Ghana to establish the successful technology in incubator, Busy Internet, which I also got to see there, um, before founding Isoku Networks there in 2005. So, Mark, please join us. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Henry. Um, <clears throat> I do feel like I'm a bit of the odd one out um, because I'm in agriculture, not in health. But I think what was interesting about this session was to try and draw parallels about, you know, what are the kinds of challenges or problems that you face in dealing with a predominantly rural, difficult-to-reach community with information services. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about what ESOCO is, and then I think we'll have a hopefully an interesting uh, discussion. Um, so SOCO means market in Swahili. Being clever West Africans, we've stolen some East African uh, uh, language. Um, and we set up, um, I, as all things with technology, you think it's going to be really easy. And initially, I hired two developers. Uh, now we have about 60 people on the team, 30 developers. And um, this is them, and they spend their time coding a platform that is trying to drive and empower agricultural businesses and information services for individuals. Um, there are lots and lots of pieces to it, uh, probably too many pieces to it. Um, there are very few people actually doing uh, a lot of agricultural innovations with uh, mobile. I mean, there are a number of projects, but there's nothing like this. And I'm very jealous walking around your conference and seeing all of these innovations. And so we don't have anything like that in, in, uh, in agriculture, which is really kind of shocking when you think that um, half of Africa still depends on agriculture for its livelihood. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a huge industry. Anyway, so the, the platform does a number of different things, and I won't get into it. But the sorts of things that it does, uh, you can profile farmers in the field. Increasingly, if you're exporting goods, you need to know who you're exporting from, where they are, what chemicals they're using, etc., etc. Uh, you can track inventory. Um, if you're not a community health worker, but you're a community agricultural worker, you probably want good, up-to-date, consistent information in your hand that you can go and advise people on uh, pests, diseases, planting, and all this kind of stuff. So there is a kind of content aspect to what we do. Um, and then there is, I think, something I didn't realize when I started. It's more important what you can get out of the field than what you can push into the field. Uh, businesses are really interested in whether their farmers are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, projects, USAID, 
uh, are all interested in monitoring whether there's an impact. Uh, so I think that a lot of us have got it wrong. It's not about pushing information out. It's actually trying to get a better understanding of what's going in there and using the mobile as a way of collecting information. So uh, this is the sort of information that we push out. These are uh, market prices. We have people in markets all over Ghana, about 40 markets, collecting the prices. Um, and uh, we push them out onto phones so that people can see them. Um, it's been difficult because um, we have, st I think this is in kilograms, and many African or Ghanaian farmers are not dealing in kilos, so you've got to convert it into local measures. Uh, you have to explain what uh, wholesale and retail, that's just a, a wholesale price, but you have to, the cost of acquiring clients and working with people is high. You have to talk to people, you have to know what they're trading in, what they're growing in, if you want to target something that is personalized to them. I suppose in health you're probably doing something similar, but in agriculture we have to know them to be able to deliver something useful to them. That makes it expensive. Um, so we do a range of different things that are pushed out over the phone. Price alerts, weather alerts, um, news alerts about uh, disease pests infestations, and offers, people who are offering to buy and sell. Um, this, this is one of our enumerators in the market that is collecting the prices. We're actually in 10 countries um, around Africa, so we have enumerators with the biggest um, market research for ag commodities, I guess, in Africa. And uh, as I mentioned, if you're actually deploying this, it's quite a lot of touch. Um, a lot of farmers, probably about 40% of them in Ghana have mobile phones and probably about 10% of them are actually, 10% of that 40% are actually texting. So a lot of what we're doing is basic phone literacy, how to access your messages, um, how to recover it, how to share and show it to a, a member of the family if you're having a problem reading messages. Um, there are lots of challenges that we face. So we have to go out into the field, and actually that's um, been a revenue generator for us because uh, a lot of what we do is consulting as opposed to just technology. These are the kinds of uh, pr promotional materials that we, that we will share. You can type in the word of your commodity, you send it to 1900, and it comes back with a response. So these are sort of typical uh, information leaflets that we'd be distributing. And I think in the last, we've been doing this for about five years. In the last year, I think we've realized that voice is a necessary complement. Um, I remember going up to a group of farmers, 40 farmers in the north of Ghana, and everybody had told me when we started this, oh, farmers can't read, so there's no point using an SMS-based service, or at least a lot of them can't read. And um, I didn't know any better. I'm a, I'm a Welsh technologist, really. Um, so I asked them in the meeting, I said, would you like the phone to speak the message to you? And they all shook their head, all of them. And I was very surprised. And I said, well, why? And they said, well, it wouldn't be written down. And I said, well, why is it important that it's written down? And they said, oh, well, then we can show it. We can show it to the trader. And it wasn't that they didn't necessarily know what the prices were, but when a trader comes to buy from a farmer, it's his word against her word. And generally, the traders always win because there's no evidence and there's a lack of confidence. And you know that's what drives all of your negotiations. So just having evidence, having it written down. And the other thing they said is that we're storing the messages. So when we decide to sell, first we look at the, message, the price this week and the last week and the week before that, they're trending the market pricing. So it's very interesting. But I think to, as you get into more sophisticated content and you start telling farmers about specific crop activities, you need to back it up with voice. They need to call somebody and say, you told me, to, you reminded me that now is the time for me to do my weeding, um, so which pesticide should I use? So we're in these countries um, around Africa, and these are some of the kind of mobile apps that we've developed. This is a sort of profiling app on the right, and on the left, this is a kind of um, content app uh, that either a government extension officer could use or an, uh, a private business. And I think some of the 
differences. These are the last two slides. I wanted to try and talk about what was different and what was similar. And I must confess, I really don't know a lot about M Health. Um, but I think that one of the things with agriculture is that it's a constant engagement. And maybe health is focused around certain events in your life, pregnancy, uh, disease, sickness, or something. But agriculture doesn't stop, and you've constantly got to feed people information. Um, it's their business. The other thing that's interesting about agriculture is that it's in people's commercial self-interest. So there's money at, at stake. And so people will engage and take it uh, seriously if they know that it actually can deliver value and make them more money, which we've been able to, to demonstrate. The other thing that we don't have in agriculture really is a focal point. You have clinics where perhaps you could focus your engagement and your services, but if we want to go out and reach farmers, we have to go out into the field. And it's difficult and it's expensive. Um, and the other thing in agriculture, you know, in health, you're always saying, well, we're going to reduce malaria by 30%, and we're going to do it by 2015, or we're going to eradicate guinea worm, or we're going to, et cetera, et cetera. We don't really have anything like that in agriculture. And I've, if anybody's got one, please let me know, because I keep trying to come up with one. But I don't think that there's the same kind of way in which you can rally um, everybody. There is one now, actually, which is food security. Everybody's worried about feeding the world, and so that has put agriculture back on, back on the agenda. Some of the ways uh, in which I think it might be similar, the kind of challenges that we face in deploying mobile-based agricultural services, is that you do have to build a fairly expensive infrastructure. Um, these kinds of systems integrate USSD, IVR, um, uh, Android, SMS, uh, multiple languages, connecting to multiple operators, it's a very expensive infrastructure. And I did, was chatting to the Grameen uh, program in Ghana. They've also built this massive, expensive uh, technology. And we were scratching our heads say, why aren't we using each other's? Why don't we combine forces? Uh, I also talked about voice complementing data. I think you do need to provide somebody who can actually talk, particularly in a local language, to uh, a person. And distribution. You need to be able to acquire clients and need to be able to support them. And I think that whoever ends up with a really good distribution network could probably deliver agricultural services, health services, other commercial services, insurance services. So getting that distribution network is really interesting. And then one of the key things, um, I think uh, Sam has a very good relationship with Safaricom in Kenya. Um, I find that the mobile operators are one of the greatest threats to um, innovation, particularly for small entrepreneurs that are trying to build services. Um, uh, Airtel, I will name names, Airtel I was with in Kenya last week, and they were saying, okay, we'll work with you, but anything that you sell, at whatever price, to whoever it is, we'll take 75%. So when you have those kind, and they've got all the power, right? You can't get to the farmers if you're not going through the operators. So I'm sure that we can twist their arms and get them to uh, come down somehow, but it is very difficult and it does take years to get it right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. It's great to see all the progress that Isoku's made in the last couple of years. Um, last but not least is uh, Matthew Taylor, who um, I'm pleased is joining us here uh, as a senior information and communications technology strategist and architect with Intel. And Intel is, I think, one of the companies out there that in my work I keep running across because you seem to be doing something in almost every domain. So it's great to see the, the investment that Intel's made in the space. Um, through Intel's World Ahead program, Matthew's worked with U.S. and foreign governments and the development community to use mobile and cloud computing technology to support scalable and sustainable economic growth across education, healthcare, agriculture, small and medium businesses, and e-government sectors. Um, Matthew and his team are currently focused on the Intel 1 million, is it 1 million by 15 health program to train 1 million health workers in developing countries by 2015 using ICT. So please join me in welcoming Matthew. Thank you, Anne May, and thank you all for coming. So a couple of things. One is, Mark, you're not the only person who's going to talk about M agriculture, so I'll be talking a little bit about some lessons learned from agriculture. Uh, however, 
what I'm going to be talking about differs uh, in one way from what uh, uh, Mark and Sam both uh, spoke about. They were both focusing on uh, real-time delivery of service, whereas uh, a lot of uh, the technologies that I've been playing around with have to do with occasionally connected uh, access and non-real-time. And there are some trade-offs that result. Okay, so next. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about some projects that Intel has done over the, over the past year or two. Uh, the first one was a, a collaboration with Catholic Relief Services and uh, had to do with stemming uh, cassava disease uh, within East Africa. Um, so obviously cassava disease is like the potato of, of Africa, very, very critical uh, to uh, the health and welfare of the population. Um, what uh, was necessary to do that was both a tracking component as well as very much a, a, an educational component. And so what we did was we uh, gave them or worked with Catholic Re Relief Services uh, to train uh, farmer groups. So there would be a, a leader and eventually this leader would become an entrepreneur uh, themselves. And that entrepreneur knows how to utilize the technology and can work with his group of farmers both to track how their crops are doing as well as to educate them on pests and, and control of disease, fertilization, and, and other aspects of successful farming. Um, what we would do, though, is the tracking was not necessarily a real-time tracking. They could store uh, the results of, of their surveys and their, their analysis and then synchronize uh, those results at a later time. Um, so that helped to reduce the, at least the recurring costs of, of such an endeavor. Uh, we deployed this to six countries, 100 partner organizations, and over a million uh, farmers uh, you know, were, were targeted uh, for being able to utilize this technology. So the idea is, you know, the good news is we were able to reduce uh, the cost of the technology implementation, both, you know, especially around recurring costs, uh, and yet be able to make, you know, a near real-time decision, but not real-time decisions uh, by empowering these people in the field. The next example is also agriculture. Uh, this one is, uh, we've mainly been focusing in Bangladesh initially, and it's a partnership uh, between Intel and Grameen, so the Intel Grameen Foundation, or Intel Grameen Social Business, uh, called Murtaka and, and Encore. And again, this involves empowering uh, agents out in the field. So we're, it's, an, it's an entrepreneurial model of uh, um, uh, enabling job growth uh, in the agriculture sector. So the entrepreneurs are equipped with soil test kits uh, and a mobile PC and uh, easy to use software. And they can go around and visit the farmers and farmer cooperatives. And uh, the goal, what they're promising or, or uh, their value proposition is to be able to get better yield with less cost. So what they do is they look at all the conditions associated with what the farmer's growing, what their soil's like, uh, what the rainfall has been like, things of that flavor and uh, can therefore recommend, uh, educate the farmer on techniques as well as recommend products uh, that can assist the farmer in being successful. So, um, and I apologize, I guess there was a little bit of a, of a, um, a graphic overlay, but uh, you know, the government and NGOs and international uh, agencies can, can uh, work with uh, these uh, entrepreneurs uh, to enable these services. Okay, and then the last is one I've been doing for the past 18 months, and uh, you may have uh, heard at a couple of the keynotes or, or other uh, announcements we're, we're gaining a lot of traction. This one stemmed from work in education, but now is being applied to vocational training and, and specifically healthcare education. Uh, so the idea is to do both pre-service and in-service training uh, of health workers uh, although this model could certainly be applied to any vocational or uh, uh, K-12 and higher ed field. Uh, again, the idea is to provide rich uh, e-learning content um, in a disconnected uh, state. 
So instead of each person having to synchronize large amounts of, of content uh, and to be able to have to re uh, re-download that content. Instead, it's what we call, what I'm calling a hub and spoke model or a store and forward model where you can have hospitals, clinics that might have a, a you know, uh, disk space is inexpensive, so they would have a uh, Wi-Fi access point uh, essentially connected to a hard disk that can store uh, the latest e-learning content. That content could either be delivered by thumb drive, you know, courier service, or uh, through download at the hospital or, or clinic. But then all of the workers who are serviced by that location uh, can come and access that content instead of downloading it over the internet. Uh, they're each simply uh, uh, collecting or um, getting that content over a local area network. So we've been working with uh, UNFPA, WHO, IHEED, some very good partners, uh, experts in instructional design, JAPAIGO, um, in uh, essentially creating starter courses. Intel, you know, we at Intel are not uh, necessarily um, health training subject matter experts, but we're uh, enabling this tool, which we're actually providing it at no charge, um, for these partners, as well as the countries themselves, uh, to empower them to create their own content. Uh, today, this content is not uh, secured, but uh, the platform certainly could support encryption technologies, digital rights management, so potentially could be used to spur uh, a whole e-learning and, and e uh, secure e-content uh, marketplace. Um, the other nice thing about the tool is when you are disconnected, you can not only uh, view the educational content, but you, it, it actually has a little database on the client, uh, which is storing what people are doing with the system. So instead of, you know, some of this content you could deliver today and maybe are delivering today PDF files, PowerPoint presentations, videos, um, or documents, but you don't have the uh, measurement and evaluation, you know, to, to get the measurement and evaluation data of whether it's being consumed and whether it's being understood uh, is another task in and of itself. Whereas with the platform, uh, you, it is actually collecting the usage and assessment data uh, and can synchronize that data when the person is back at the hospital or clinic with either access to a local server or the Internet. And the amount of data going back up uh, to collect that information is extremely small. So the user gets a, a very good user experience of being able, able to get rich content without the weight or the frustration of the download, uh, and yet uh, we can collect the usage data very easily. Uh, so we're currently working in uh, a number of places in Africa, uh, China, uh, sub I'm sorry, Sub-Saharan Africa, China, and uh, um, uh, Asia Pacific. Um, and so, you know, we're certainly engaging at the uh, country and partner level uh, to enable them to use this tool. Uh, one other thing, you know, is we're also looking to extend the tool. Uh, it does have the ability to, to be able to uh, utilize form data, so you could collect uh, HTML uh, and PDF form data uh, when you're offline and, again, synchronize that back uh, when you're at an appropriate location. So actually, there's an error on this slide. Um, so I was thinking about Anne May's uh, you know the discussion of of what can we learn, and you know what are the what are the challenges of sustainability and scalability, and all all, all of this um, in making real headway in using ICT in emerging countries. And again, I apologize the the PDF conversion appeared to move things around a little bit. So one of the things that I think a lot about is total cost of ownership. And so obviously when you're dealing with uh, an ICT-based solution, you have to worry about the device, you have to worry about the software, you have to worry about data transfer or connectivity, and uh, occasionally you have to worry about the cost of content. Uh, so certainly you want to be aware of whatever solution you're building, uh, what are the implications both from a capital cost and recurring cost perspective. Um, the mistake is value is not total cost over productivity. It's actually uh, the inverse. And I would add to productivity, you know, the benefit, the outcome benefits. Uh, in other words, one thing we do whenever we engage uh, in projects is talk about what we call key performance indicators. 
In other words, how does uh, the, how do the folks we're working with measure the success of their program? So we certainly want to take into account those key performance ind indicators, which obviously involve uh, productivity and outcomes. Uh, obviously, in the healthcare space, security is a key, uh, um, has to be uh, uh, solved uh, in any of those cases. And then, obviously, you're dividing that by the cost of, of the implementation. So, and another one of the things we look at are usage models. What we want to understand is what, is the, what are the usage models that we're trying to achieve with the technology. So certainly in a real-time environment where the amount of data uh, b needing to be transferred is small, uh, SMS is an excellent uh, uh, technology. Uh, and f certainly if your reach involves reaching uh, every citizen, uh, as we all know, uh, you know, 90% plus of, you know, or a large percentage of people have access uh, to, to mobile SMS and voice. Um, when you get into richer applications and multiple usage models, you know, there you have to consider the full spectrum of devices. So feature phones, smartphones, and now, of course, the hot thing on everyone's mind is, t is tablets. And so Intel actually is, is in the tablet space and in the smartphone space as well. So we have the latest and greatest tablet here um, running on Windows 8. Uh, eventually there will be tablets on Android as well. So you can have your whole rich e-learning uh, content experience uh, on a tablet, hook it up to a, to a um, uh, hook it up to a keyboard as necessary. So over time, these devices will continue to become more affordable, but not only worry about the affordability of the device. Does it have to be connected? How much is the software? How much is the content? How many different things can you do with this versus this? Or would you want to do with this versus this versus a feature phone? So Cutting to the chase, and what are the key learnings that, that uh, we've experienced from, uh, from these projects that we've done and others? The first is, you know, think about those recurring costs. Um, segment your real-time versus your store and forward data requirements. Um, this fancy picture up, up at the top is what I call a hub-and-spoke architecture. I'm a technical guy. So the idea is if you can get those yellow circles connected, then you can service all the people who can get to those yellow circles. And the cost of doing that, you know, enabling connectivity to all those individuals can be a lot more expensive and, and uh, troublesome than enabling them to come to a hub location uh, to synchronize their data, both downward and upward. Um, from a software perspective, uh, absolutely there are times to be online, but certainly there's a lot that can be done on offline, um, in, and especially where you need to extend reach. Uh, sync to what we call the occasionally connected cloud, or sync to uh, the hub via a local area network. And this can help yield a lower cost per user. Um, Certainly make a system, and the, the school system that I talked about supports any language. It basically utilizes a web browser, so you can deliver e-learning content in any language. And through XML, we make it parameterized, so you can add uh, user interface support in, in any language. Uh, and then when you design your tools, design them, if you have software developers, design them to automatically collect the key performance indicator data you need so you can prove to your donors or investors that what you're doing is actually yielding success. Uh, already talked about multi-purpose multi devices. Um, uh, a lot of the usage models that we're involved in involve education, data collection, collaboration, uh, decision support, uh, things of that flavor. Um, certainly whenever you're dealing with healthcare data, you need to understand what data can be in the clear and what data do you absolutely have to have secured, especially from a policy perspective. So we're always thinking along those lines. When you're adding up the cost when you're doing a project and people ask you what's it going to cost, one of your questions should be, well, how much does it cost now? How much are people traveling? How much are people away from you know, their, their normal job to get trained or, or do other services? Uh, are you shipping paper around? 
Uh, are you paying for hotels and, and meals? So you need to compare apples to apples uh, when looking at utilizing ICT. Um, and obviously account for not only the uh, quantity gains, but also the quality gains in what you're doing with your project. And then finally for us, at, at the end of the day, you know, the, the partners that we work with, it's about successful global development of their country. So it's about job creation. So, you know, the best ICT solution is a solution that enables uh, uh, empowering of the people so that they can utilize the technology that you deliver to create local jobs. And that's it. Thank you very much. So, um, are these mics on? Great. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so it looks like we have about 25 minutes left in this session. I have a few questions that I was going to ask the panelists, but I wanted to first uh, see if there's questions from the audience because we want to make sure we cover the things that are most interesting to you. Are there um, any folks that have questions? Go ahead, please. My name is Rajiv. Uh, this question is for Matthew. Um, you mentioned about some total cost of ownership. What are the challenges you are seeing in terms of funding? Uh, in different countries, and how do you overcome that? Is that all funded by Intel, or how do you see that? So certainly Intel, like my fellow panelists, is a for-profit business. Um, we make the chips that go into uh, everything from feature phones to smartphones to tablets to computers. Um, we can't afford to give those away. We certainly help with uh, private pro uh, 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 projects. Um, however, there, there are th in terms of finding funding, uh, as I said earlier, governments are looking to solve certain problems. Uh, they have some degree of funds. They obviously get some amount of funds from uh, donor banks, donors, uh, et cetera, a taxation. Um, I think what we found, the issue is total cost of ownership for the government, uh, uh, you know, or the program as a whole. And it often has to be uh, shared. In other words, the government may provide VAT tax relief. Um, there might be a financing partner who can uh, provide a low interest rate. Uh, to be able, you know, a, a lot of this has to do with capital cost versus recurring costs and how that relates to both your ability to start a project but also your ability to sustain a project. So um, uh, certainly uh, financing uh, enables uh, utilization uh, as, as well as the, at the end of the, you know, end of the day, it isn't about giving things away for free, it's about providing value for what you're, what you're uh, doing. Uh, one of the things we often do in our IC projects is you want to start uh, small and show immediate, you know, don't try to do everything at once, but be able to show immediate value early on. And if you can do that, then there is the ability to monetize. You know, obviously the two gentlemen to my left, they need to monetize uh, their uh, capabilities. Intel has a slightly different model in that our monetization comes from the capital investment uh, and so, uh, to some degree, the tools like uh, what we're, some of what we're talking about here, we, we try to save um, money from a recurring cost perspective to enable uh, affordability and sustainability. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, please just come to the microphone if you have a question. This question is for Mark Davies. How do you get around the uh, high cost, that 75% tariff with the telcos? Do you design your architecture to avoid that or pass your messages in a standard way that the billing is, um, how do you avoid that tariff, that high cost? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, it, you know, for me, this is a complicated business, and I think the most complicated part of it are the mobile operators. And you know, I've been talking to them for five years, 
And I think consistently, when you, if you want to share war stories with anybody in M projects, then probably at the top of the list is going to be the mobile operators. They're so big, they're so wealthy, you know, they've got all the power. Uh, it's difficult, and particularly in an area like agriculture where it's not really interesting to them. It only becomes interesting um, as their urban penetration rates begin to stagnate and they see rural as an area of expansion and where they're really getting more competitive with the other operators. So what you do is you go to Airtel and Airtel will say 75%. You say, oh, but I'm talking to Vodafone. And Vodafone is going to do it for me for 50% or whatever. And then, you know, you go to the next one and you say, well, we're talking to Tigo. So the only time I've ever seen them back off is when you mention their competitors. And I think that's the way to do it. Thank you. Um, Matthew, Sam, do, do either of you have um, sort of other experiences to share in sort of working with operators? Because it's true, operators have such a strong hold um, because they are the, the channel to the user. It, um, I know from building mobile services myself that, you know, you can build a great service, but if you're not on the dock um, of the phone, it's very, very hard to get in front of users for users to be aware of it to actually use your service. So operators hold the keys to that, and it, it can be tough because they have all the, all the um, chips um, on the negotiating table. Yes, I mean, uh, I think the experience that we've had, um, it's taken us, you know, three years to eventually um, get to uh, sign up something with, uh, with a mobile uh, operator. But it all really arises because of, uh, I think, what has just been mentioned, that um, the competition has been very, very stiff uh, in Kenya. And therefore, um, you know, uh, rates, calling rates and, and connectivity rates have gone down drastically over the last, say, two years. Um, as a result, you know, each uh, provider, each uh, network operator has been looking for, you know, ways of, of, of uh, increasing, you know, uh, stickiness. Um, and as a result, you know, um, b because, you know, just, you know, um, whatever they're getting on, on, on voice um, has gone down by, you know, more than 50 or 60 percent over the last two years. And therefore, you know, um, developing value-added services such as, you know, what we've done in health then helps them to get additional, you know, uh, stickiness and, and revenue lines, which are non-traditional. So um, I think the only way, essentially, is to get, you know, the mobile to get the mobile operators talking, as, as, as has been said here, is is to be able to have, you know, strong competition uh, in the, uh, you know, among the providers. So Intel obviously works a lot with providers and. Um, not so much from a services perspective, but from a bundling perspective, you know, just like in the United States, um, uh, mobile service operators want to um, move into data delivery uh, uh, as, as a new source of, of revenue. Uh, I fully agree with my, my partners that, that more competition and more infrastructure will lead to that, uh, lead to more competition. Um, from an infrastructure perspective, Intel gets very involved at a government level with policies uh, for telecommunications as well as use of universal service funds uh, to accelerate the build out and availability uh, of, of more broadband connectivity. Um, yeah, I'll stop, I'll stop there. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to continue the questions. If anyone has a question from the audience, please step up to the mic and we'll, uh, we'll turn to you. Um, I just want to follow up on the first question, actually, about um, the total cost of ownership, because I think that this is also a, a big issue, and not just total cost of ownership, but just access in general. And I was curious if um, each of the panelists maybe could tell a story about um, how access has been a challenge with your products. You know, and access could mean, you know, lack of coverage or connectivity in certain rural areas. It could mean, you know, I saw on one of Mark's slides a bunch of Android uh, phone pictures, you know, that people may not have advanced devices in many cases. Um, so in the cases where people don't have the right device, where they don't have coverage, where, um, ac um, where, where getting a service plan or getting data service is extremely expensive, what are, what are some of the um, cases where you've run into those issues and what are some of the ways that you've been able to work around them? <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Right. I think um, that that's a very you know, good uh, question. Um, obviously, the question of access is, is, is a challenge. And uh, the first one is just, you know, uh, what's the level of coverage? Um, if there are certain areas, um, for example, when we started off our program, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, being able to, to, to spread out of the urban areas, that was a challenge because there are certain areas that do not have, you know, any, you know, or a reliable uh, network coverage. And having a system that relies, you know, entirely on on a GPRS system meant that there are certain areas that were definitely, you know, um, excluded. But um, just as you know, we had, you know, talked mentioned a bit earlier, the fact of competition ensures then that um, you know mobile operators then you know spread out um, you know into into um, the areas where they deem you know uh, profitable and as such you know our rollout you know of the rollout for our products has actually then as a, of necessity followed the rollout of the network coverage um, in the country uh, one other um, challenge to access has been the fact that you know we rely on you know on people making you know use of their mpesa accounts as the basis for making their medical savings and you know subsequently you know their their micro insurance premium payments now the transaction costs um, you know, I, you know, not just you know the the the, the, the um, coverage as we had said, but even transaction costs can be a challenge because if you're getting people to transfer money from their you know mobile money accounts to a savings account, and the transaction costs need to be sufficiently um, low for that proposition to be attractive, um, and that you know uh, has you know was a barrier. To, uh, to, to access, uh, but from about March of this year, once again, there was a, a major, you know, reduction of uh, the, uh, you know, transaction, you know, costs, and that, you know, in fact has enabled us to substantially uh, scale up uh, because of, of, of the, you know, uh, lower uh, uh, operating costs. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the softball question for me because, um, the work that I'm doing is all about extending reach into areas where there's limited or no coverage. Um, so from that standpoint, it's, it's build your solution so that it, it can withstand that and at least provide the 80-20 rule, provide 80 percent of the, of, of the functionality uh, in a disconnected state. Obviously, the other things we deal with from an infrastructure perspective that are a challenge are obviously electricity, um, you know, and so we continue to drive down the cost, the uh, power consumption of devices, uh, make them 12 volt compatible so you can charge them off of solar and, and, and batteries. Um, we've gotten to the point where the, 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 um, uh, the um, power consumption of the, of the processor uh, you know, you have you have flash memory. You don't have a rotating disk anymore, and the power of the processor is is much less than the power of the. It's really the power of the screen, <laughs> and the brightness of the screen. Um, but you know, we're we're continuing to make headways from that standpoint. So those are the ways that we're enabling these solutions really to function anywhere. We're not trying to get to every, well, maybe we are trying to get to every farmer, but we're, we're, you know, there are four million farmers in Ghana. If we can get to 50,000 of them, then, you know, that's good enough for us um, in some ways. The, so that kind of coverage for most farmers is fine. Um, what we find is, find is that there is problems with text messaging, which you wouldn't necessarily find in Kenya where M-Pesa has sort of driven phone literacy or in Zimbabwe where they're, uh, education literacy is, is greater. We see a lot of variation. Um, but Chinese phones confuse a lot of uh, the Ghanaian farmers. That's one thing that we've noticed. The entry of uh, uh, Chinese phones, uh, they feel very uncomfortable with those interfaces. Um, 
access is also dependent on neighbors and children. You know, you need, an, you know, not everybody will be able to read the message you send them, but they'll be able to get somebody to read it. So you've got to have a fairly kind of clever approach when you enter communities and you bring the kids to the training. You'll also notice that women don't necessarily come to the first trainings, but there are actually more women farmers in Ghana than there are men farmers. Um, so you've got to be fairly strategic about making sure that you reach out and you make sure that they're there because they may take a sort of second role and sort of maybe not feel that they should be at the men's event and so forth. So those are sort of the human side of access. Um, uh, but in terms of making money, you know, we can, if we charge a dollar a month and it seems that the farmers can make a hundred dollars um, a year. So, you know, they're business folks and they can add it up and it's not complicated and there's no other cost of ownership in the sense that they've just got the phone and you're giving them specific commercial <laughs> advisories and they know how to, how to leverage that. Hi, I'm John Zoltner from FHI 360. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, SMS right now is the only way to massively reach uh, poor people in developing countries. But is, do you see any time in, in the next decade uh, enough access through, through, not, through either through mobile internet or through other methods of connectivity in order to avoid the charges on SMS, in order to, to more on a massive level and not with uh, uh, just test programs where a certain number of, of free accounts are given away or, or free smartphones, but where you'd be able to uh, avoid uh, paying the, the SMS telecom fee for every message sent? Yeah, um, th there is obviously, um, a, a, you know, a, a um, the growth of um, mobile uh, internet, uh, certainly in, in, in our country, and uh, quite a number of people are using it now, and you know, you don't really have to have a smartphone to, to, to have access to the internet. But, um, you know, the SMS, you know, will continue to be a very serious uh, medium uh, of communication. Um, um, and, um, you know, I think the the uh, the solution lies in you know as we had said earlier in you know uh, having a, a more competitive space that then enables um, you know the price of in the cost of SMSs to go down. Um, one of the things we're doing, for example, you know the, the micro insurance in you know, a program that, that that we're launching will be marketed primarily you know, by SMS. Um, but you know the mobile operator sees value in in uh, in lowering the cost of these SMSs because it's actually going to you know get you know the volumes uh, in, um, and it's uh, you know for them um, by partnering with the with the mobile network operator, it means that you know, we're able to actually you know send these SMSs at cost, right? So. Um, Whereas, you know, um, as we just said, you know, mobile, you know, um, internet, you know, will continue, you know, will soon become, you know, significant. I do not think that in the foreseeable future we will see uh, the downgrading of the importance of, of, of SMSs. I, um, voice messages is expensive, more expensive than SMS, but it's an alternative that people are really looking at and is, I think, growing in popularity in health and in agriculture delivery. I don't see farmers having, um, you know, well, there are plenty of rich farmers who've got fancy phones, um, but it, not broadly, uh, not internet, um, that level of sophistication. But I don't think that necessarily you have to look at the model where the end user pays the, the fee. I think there are other, I mean, for us, the big understanding is that, you know, the way to drive agriculture and address poverty in Africa is to enable the businesses that serve these consumers. That's what we're trying to do. So if you're helping a business, and we just simply, you know, and they say, well, what's ESOCO going to do for us? We say, we'll save you money on diesel. That's our value proposition. And we'll go in and we'll calculate it. How much are you spending to send the truck out? How much are you spending... Uh, to call all 50 of your traders or suppliers, let's work that out. And they may be spending $40, $50 a week, um, and we can save them money. 
And I think that the, the SMSs, you know, have come down. I mean, we're negotiating SMS rates, broadly speaking, in most of the African markets of, um, you know, half a U.S. cent. And I think it can come down even further. But I do think that you can get the agribusinesses, maybe the health providers, I don't know, the tablet d makers. I think that you're targeting the wrong people to pay. In fact, you know, for those that are trying to access you, Mr. or Mrs. Farmer, as a buyer of my fertilizer or my seed or a provider of my stock, um, once you can deliver them as a demographic, then I think the business um, will pay to reach them. And I think there's no reason that you can't take, instead of it's half a cent to reach them, you charge somebody two cents and maybe you, you just take half a cent and you pay that to the farmer so that you start turning it around, the model, and you say, well, actually, if you're part of this system, you can make money. So make sure that your farm size, your profile, your chemicals, you build that profile and then you become an advertising opportunity, as it, as it were. I, in the first, uh, I'm from Guatemala, uh, the Alliance for Nutrition. Um, in the first two cases, w what is the number of, of clients that you're uh, servicing per month or whatever? In, uh, I think that we've got about 100,000 farmers on the system, um, and uh, we would aim to get to about um, uh, 50 or 60,000 individual subscribers, and then um, 200 businesses with another 500, I can't do the maths right away, but I think it's, um, it's very slow going. I mean, I would have estimated in Ghana we've got 25,000. I would have estimated we'd be at 100, 200,000 by now. Um, but I think it's, um, there's, a, there's a whole other story behind that. Okay. Uh, in our case, before we you know, signed up this partnership, you know, it has taken us uh, about three years to get to, to uh, 20,000, but uh, you know uh, the projections now is that in the next one year we'll get at least 250,000, and uh, maybe within about two years get a million people uh, on board. So you know the, the ability to scale really you know um, you know comes with with being able to to get the I mean the synergies that come with working with the M with the mobile network operator. Great, thank you. Um, just congratulations. For me, the true sustainability is when somebody is willing to pay for your service, not where the, your, your next grant money is coming or your next funding or your next donor. It's really when you provide a service that somebody is willing to pay. So thank you. Jim. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just make a comment. We just have a couple minutes left here that, you know, when we talk about total cost of ownership, I, um, for some specific services, there certainly makes sense to have grant money or otherwise to be able to support those specific services. But overall, I believe that the free market has got to bring those prices down to be affordable to people. And we're seeing that already with device costs because it's a very competitive market in, in creating devices. We're seeing $80 Android phones in Kenya, for example, from Huawei. Um, and, you know, one of the things we're working on at the State Department is looking at ways to drive um, data costs down dramatically because data costs are quite high, especially in Africa. Um, and, and I think Kenya, again, has taken the lead there in actually um, having healthy competitive markets that are driving those costs down, but there's still room to go there on, on all fronts. Um, did you have a last question there before we close? Yeah. Just a quick question. Hi, I'm Neri from UN Foundation. Um, I'm presuming that most of these households or customers that you work with don't have electricity in their homes. And I was wondering how that um, lack of energy access has impacted your business in terms of reach for your information and if you're working on any solutions to address that. Yeah, um, I think the, um, you know, the fact of no electricity has actually then brought other other opportunities, you know, um, in Kenya. There are very, very interesting and innovative ways that people have created for charging their phones. Uh, there's a lot of solar chargers. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, car battery, you know, uh, car batteries being used to charge. Um, and, um, you know, the fact that, that, that you know, the, um, electricity coverage is low, but then you have, you know, 90% of the population having access to a mobile phone means somebody has also found a business opportunity to create, you know, uh, you know um, opportunities for, for charging of, of phones. Um, so um, I, I think that, um, you know, 
uh, I think the, the answer to that is that you know um, whenever you have um, opportunity, you know, then innovation, you know, follows. All right, and uh, you know it, it's 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 you know th that that's what we've been able to um, to see in, in in our situation. Yeah, I, I've seen um, uh, I've been to places where there's no electricity and no phone signal yet. Everybody's got a phone, and I'm like, how is that possible? <laughs> you know, and you go to the store, and there's the car battery, and the car battery go is recharged, and then they go up the hill, and then they can just get a signal, uh, maybe not for a voice call, but for SMS. I think the thing is to be you know, is to realize that most of these interventions are not trying to cover everybody immediately, right? You're trying to go where people have service. Um, and, you know, we're still at very small numbers. So, um, you know, you're easily covered. And uh, I think that raises a whole other question of whether you're further excluding other people and whether there's another digital divide that you're part of. But I think that, you know, we're just lucky that we can make certain steps and address those communities that are uh, that are interested and that are able to benefit from it and have the, the systems and the power to, to use it. Great, and I think unfortunately we're out of time. I just want to thank our panelists for sharing their wealth of experience with, with everyone and for the audience for the excellent questions. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>